the topic of uh, session three is AI policy. As AI technology develops, related policies are becoming more important. So we will listen to presentations and discussions about the efforts of government around the world uh, to vitalize AI. So I would like to invite our chair, uh, Professor Choi Moon Jong, a, uh, at the Graduate School of Science and Technology Policy at KAIS and Panels. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome them with a warm hand. Okay, thank you. Good, good afternoon and also good morning and good evening in many uh, uh, different places around the world. And I'm Moon Choi and I'm so honored to be a part of this wonderful symposium and in the previous session on ethics. And I really like the, the, the Professor Windfield's word, the invisible infrastructure. Ethics is an in, invisible infrastructure, but it has a limitation because of the lack of enforcement mechanism. So in this session, we are going to discuss key questions for AI policy, and we have a wonderful uh, panelist and wonderful present, uh, presenters, and we are going to provide multidisciplinary perspectives from scholars in law, future studies, and political science, and public policy. And the first uh, the speaker is Professor Simon uh, Chesterman, and he's going to give a presentation about when and why and how to regulate AI. It's a very fundamental question about AI policy. And he is the Dean and Provost Chair Professor of National University of Singapore, a Faculty of Law. And he is educated uh, many different uh, places around the world, Melbourne, Beijing, Amsterdam, and Oxford. And he's teaching uh, experience in, uh, at the University of Melbourne, Oxford, South uh, Southampton, Columbia, and Science Po. And he is also the global professor and a director of the NIU School of Law Singapore program. And before joining NIU, he was a senior associate at the International Peace Economy and director of the UN relations at the International Crisis Group in New York. And please welcome him with a big uh, applause. Uh, professor Chesterman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be taking part in this presentation, and um, I'm, I'm delighted to be on a, such a distinguished panel. Uh, and indeed, as you said, it's following on from the previous discussion of ethics. And uh, in the context of AI policy, the, the key questions I'll be focusing on is what policy makers can and should be doing uh, at this time. Uh, and I'll try to uh, share some slides. Hopefully, this is now visible. Looks like it is. And so, really, I'm trying to think through the, the why, the when, and the how to regulate AI. Uh, and I've inten intentionally left out the, the what regulations should be. That's something I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, but I think there is a bit of a tendency in this context to jump straight to what the rules should be, rather than thinking about why we're developing rules, when they should be developed, and how they should be implemented. Um, and indeed, one of the problems with AI, certainly from a legal perspective, is there's a tendency to think that this is all completely brand new. It's all greenfield technology, it's greenfield regulatory policy, that everything's got to start from scratch, when in fact, most laws can handle most of the problems raised by artificial intelligence most of the time, but not all of the time. And so I'll start off with some of the challenges. And the way I think about this is in three baskets of challenges that, that AI really does pose to traditional regulatory structures. Although again, I emphasize that most of those structures can deal with most of the problems. But the first challenge is speed. Uh, this is not new. This is something that technology policy has always had to grapple with. Uh, and to give you a, an example, a decade old, this is the flash crash of May 2010, when in the space of 30 minutes, a um, trillion dollars was wiped off the New York Stock Exchange, and no one knew why. And then in 15 minutes, almost all of it came back. And underlying the problem was high-frequency trading algorithms, uh, because in theory, these algorithms were operating under the same legal rules as you and me. So if I was to sell Professor Kim uh, a security, a stock, uh, and then buy it back from her, 
Um, the computers were governed by the same rules, but while it might take us at least a minute or two to do a transaction, uh, these computers are doing tens of thousands of transactions every second, and that's why it's spir spiraled out of control. So that I hope I don't need to dwell on that. Speed does pose a challenge sometimes. It's more of a, a practical challenge than a conceptual one, uh, and has led to uh, things like circuit breakers slowing down um, time in, um, in some of these contexts of securities regulations, for example. But that, that's one type of problem. A second problem, uh, more specific to artificial intelligence, is autonomy. And probably the easiest example here is autonomous vehicles. Uh, and the concern gets raised, well, if an autonomous vehicle crashes into you, um, who's to blame if you can't blame the driver? Uh, and um, that does appear on its face to suggest problems, but the law already can deal with some of these situations as well. I mean, if I crash into Alex because I'm driving badly, um, then he might be able to sue me for damages. But if I injure him because my car blows up, he can't sue me, but he might be able to sue the manufacturer. Uh, and increasingly, I think what we're going to see is in areas where humans are handing over control for various activities to machines, you'll have to see a, a shift from uh, the user's liability to manufacturer's liability. Again, some challenges here in terms of how you identify who's responsible, but not really a fundamental ch challenge to law. Um, a third category is opacity. Uh, this is a different kind of challenge. It really came up in the last decade uh, with the rise of machine learning techniques that are increasingly hard to understand. Now, again, complexity is not entirely new in law, but by opacity, what I mean is the difficulty of understanding something. Um, this has long been a challenge in some areas of law. There are areas in which trade secrets make it difficult to work out what's going on, uh, but courts can get around that with a court order. Um, some things are just complicated. They're hard to understand. Well, we can usually get around by that, that by relying on experts. Uh, but increasingly, in some forms of machine learning uh, technologies that are now being deployed, it is literally impossible for a human to understand or for the machine to explain in a manner that a human can understand, meaning we have a trade-off. We have a trade-off between understanding uh, and, in some cases, accuracy, that you can increase the ability to understand by reducing the number of variables that might reduce the accuracy. Um, now, this is not always a problem. We don't always care about understanding a technology. Uh, in the field of medicine, for example, uh, there are various pharmaceuticals, various psychiatric treatments which work. We, we have statistical randomized trials that show that they work, uh, but we don't exactly know why at a molecular level. Uh, and that's okay, provided we're satisfied with the statistics. Um, if you move from me medical technology, however, to law, if a judge, for example, were to say that I find you guilty, but I can't explain why, I can merely tell you there's a statistical basis for that finding, uh, then most of us would feel that there's something going wrong there. So these are some of the challenges that AI poses, or at least the way I've analyzed it. What's the response? Well, a problem is that for much of the history of artificial intelligence, we didn't get a lot further than this guy. Uh, and some of you may recognize Isaac Asimov, a famous science fiction writer, who in 1942 um, came up in a short story with the three laws of robotics, uh, which actually Korea, when it was uh, first developing um, regulations or attempt to govern artificial intelligence back in the early 2000s, explicitly referenced. Uh, and so these are his three laws. A um, couple of problems with this. Um, the first, they're not really laws in the sense of what someone or something could or should do. More importantly, for our purposes, what many people seem to forget about Isaac Asimov is that his laws didn't work. And indeed, if they had worked, his literary career would have been very brief. Most of his stories worked around the idea of the difficulty of enforcing these laws in practice, the difficulty of the robots themselves applying these laws. Uh, and so I think this is a problem because the tendency in many of these discussions uh, although I think the previous panel was a bit more sophisticated, the tendency in many of these discussions is to say what we need is a list of new ethical principles, a list of new guidelines, uh, some new laws, and that will solve all our problems. Uh, and that's what doesn't, that's what hundreds of all the last five years in particular. Uh, we have hundreds of examples of lists of ethical principles, guides, frameworks, and so on. Uh, and it really took off around 2016. So why did it take off around 2016? in part because of the expansive uh, role of, um, of artificial intelligence, the rise of machine learning that I mentioned earlier, uh, but in particular, I think because of the Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, and the realization that these technologies didn't just run the risk of an autonomous vehicle crashing into someone 
or an AI system uh, making a mistake or uh, or defrauding someone or helping, uh, meaning that they weren't eligible to get a benefit or a job, uh, but these algorithms could in fact change the course of human history. Uh, and so the perception that some of these algorithms were in fact influencing American politics and may have had an impact on the election of uh, President Trump, I think really up the ante. And it was around that context that uh, many of these organizations, in particular, companies like Microsoft, Google, IBM, all in the first six months of 2018, when the Cambridge Analytica scandal became fully public, that was when they adopted these rules. Uh, and of course, this has continued to today with uh, the European Union adopting its draft regulation back in April. UNESCO has adopted a document, the OSCE is working on one, that the Pope adopted one, uh, signed on to one in 2020. So what do all these things boil down to? Well, I won't go through them in detail, uh, but in general, there are six overlapping principles uh, that tend to be uh, tend to appear in all of these documents. Um, they all, in different ways, talk about the need for human control. They say that transparency is important, safety is important, accountability, non-discrimination, privacy should be respected. These are all perfectly good things, hard to disagree. The question I would ask is, are any of these actually necessary? Safety, for example, can for the most part be covered by product liability. Accountability is a way of saying that the law should apply to AI systems and the people acting through them, whether those are humans or corporations, just as it would if the human or corporation were acting themselves. Non-discrimination, of course, AI systems shouldn't be biased. Of course, they should respect human rights. Uh, and similarly, they should also apply data protection laws. In short, you shouldn't be able to do something using an AI system uh, that you couldn't do yourself. Human control and transparency are a little bit different because these suggest things that might actually restrain the development of technology. Uh, and perhaps that's something we can talk about in conversation later on. Um, but I really wanna close off my presentation by talking about different questions, why, when, and how to regulate. So why regulate? Why are we trying to regulate? Well, in general, we, mark, we, we regulate in order to try to address market failures. So through the 20th century, for example, we had the rise of product liability because we realized that just putting the onus on the buyer, buyer beware, was unfair. And that the corporations that were making products were in a much better situation to guard against the risks and to potentially compensate the losses with insurance if need be. So we can use regulation to address market failures so that uh, injustice is falling in the sort of most efficient area. Um, but sometimes it's not just market efficiency. Sometimes it's in support of social or other policies. Even if, for example, you could prove that it was efficient to discriminate on the basis of race, gender, uh, religion, and so on, most societies would say that's not a sound basis for um, conduct, and therefore we should prohibit that, uh, that activity, even if it were efficient. Against this, sometimes there are arguments that you shouldn't regulate, that you should hold back on regulation, that you don't want to constrain innovation, you don't want to lose your competitive advantage. And we've seen very different approaches uh, in places like the United States, where the market tends to be quite important, Europe, where rights tend to dominate, uh, and China, where state sovereignty and national security has tended to, to shape the, the reasons for regulation. What about the when question? When should we regulate? Well, here I'll fall back on a 30-year-old book by David Collingridge uh, called The Social Control of Technology and what's now known as the Collingridge Dilemma because he pointed out that at an early stage, it's easy to regulate technology. The costs are low, but we don't know what the harms are. We don't know enough to target our regulation appropriately uh, and we run the risk of unnecessarily slowing its development. If we wait, however, by the time those consequences have become clear, uh, the costs have gone way up. So if you think, for example, what we could have done to Facebook back in 2004 when it was being launched, you could imagine regulating Facebook back then, jump forward to 2021, and it's much harder to imagine how we can regulate. And there's the big debates about how we regulate what's now meta. Um, and so that is an example of the, the, the dilemma that I think we're facing in the context of artificial intelligence. The precautionary principle and masterly inactivity uh, concepts that are sometimes raised in this context um, just to touch on the precautionary principle, this is borrowed from environmental law, where if there is a very clear harm at stake, uh, you shouldn't wait for scientific certainty before acting to address it. Um, the difficulty in the context of uh, artificial intelligence is agreeing on precisely what the harm is, however. So that's the when question. What about the how? We tend to focus, I think, on supply of regulation. Regulators have hammers, they go around looking for nails. Um, but I think it's important to separate at least three different uh, forms of regulation, three different purposes of regulation. 
One is just to manage risks. In some of these contexts, all we want to do is manage the risks. This is classic uh, market efficiency regulation. And in the context of autonomous vehicles, we just want them to be safe. How do we make them safe? How do we minimize unnecessarily losses and ensure that where there is harm, the right person is paying for it? That's actually reasonably simple in the context of regulation. There are, however, some red lines. Uh, and I think uh, in the context of lethal autonomous weapons, for example, there's a serious argument going on now that, um, that there should be a red line, that lethal autonomous weapons should not be making battlefield determinations about whom to target, whom to kill. Um, we're seeing a similar debate about real-time biometric surveillance. That's one of the red lines that the European Union is proposing. So there are some red lines that even if there were uh, efficient ways of doing things, you still don't want to do them uh, because uh, they violate some social or other norm. Uh, and then a third category of, of regulation, I think, is in the area of process legitimacy. This is the idea that uh, we don't just want an efficient decision. We don't just want a decision made by any old human uh, in the context, for example, of battlefield decisions. Uh, what we want is a particular person to take a decision. Uh, and that's, for example, uh, the case of the judge, I think is a good example, where judges make decisions uh, and their decisions are binding, not because they're geniuses, although we hope they are wise, uh, but because they exist within a political hierarchy uh, where their authority comes not from their personal virtues and abilities, but from the role they play within that politically accountable system. So I'm coming to the end because I want to leave time for uh, discussion, uh, but all this to say that um, this is clearly more than hypothetical. I mentioned the European Union's draft regulation. Uh, it was very quickly countered by a consultancy that said all this will do is cost you money. It'll just drive innovation elsewhere. So that's one of the dilemmas that regulators have to grapple with. Uh, and meanwhile, there have been interesting innovations where uh, after several failures in different courts around the world, in the, the European Union, the United States and the United Kingdom, um, a, a couple of activists managed to persuade an Australian federal court that an AI system could be recognised as an inventor for the purposes of patent law, uh, which suggests some of the possible uh, evolutions that will come in this important area. Um, so I'll stop there. That's a very brief, shameless plug if you want to hear more about, uh, read more about my work. Uh, but uh, like all of you, I'm looking forward to the other panellists' presentations uh, and a rich discussion to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful uh, the presentations. And it's very interesting uh, what kind of uh, regulation is and also, you know, whether we have evidence for regulation. And it, it was very interesting to uh, uh, heard about the demand for regulation. And now we are moving to the second uh, speaker. And the second speaker is Mr. Martin Ford. And I guess many of you have uh, uh, read his book, The Rise of Robots, and it's translated in 20 different languages, and one of them is Korean. And he's a futurist and the author of four books, including that book, and also The, uh, the Technology and the Threat of Journalist Future, and that, and also Architecture of Intelligence, The Truth About AI from the People uh, Building It. And he is well-known TED talker, TED talker, and on the impact of AI in robotics on the economy and society. And that video was viewed uh, by more than uh, three million, uh, you know, people times. So, uh, please welcome Mr. Uh, Martin Ford with a big applause. Thank you very much. It's really uh, a great pleasure and honor to uh, to be here. Uh, when you think of AI policy for a country, I do think it's very important right from the onset to recognize that there are two sides to artificial intelligence. You know, there are opportunities as well as risks and dangers. And definitely any AI policy needs to recognize that and I think should absolutely embrace artificial intelligence. So certainly one part of policy should be to, you know, fully leverage this technology to do everything we possibly can to embrace it and to advance it. Because I do believe that artificial intelligence is going to be indispensable to us in the future in terms of solving uh, the problems that humanity faces, in particular things like climate change. Uh, you know, it's, it's a technology that will become a primary tool that will, in a sense, uh, amplify our creativity, our, our intelligence, our ability to innovate. And I think that that's going to be absolutely critical in terms of uh, confronting many of these problems. Uh, so the last thing that we would want to ever do as a matter of policy is to really, you know, dampen down or restrict artificial intelligence. Uh, we definitely want to embrace that innovation. But having said that, uh, 
clearly there are a number of risks and dangers that come with this technology and we need to approach those with open eyes. And in many cases, there will be um, a call, I think, for regulation and you know, a very definite need for regulation or rules to govern uh, the technology. But my, my feeling very strongly is that rather than attempting to regulate artificial intelligence as a whole, or in particular, in any way, restrict research into artificial intelligence, uh, what we should be doing is focusing on developing rules and regulations to govern particular applications of artificial intelligence. Uh, in other words, we want to be very careful about how this technology is actually used, how it impacts people, uh, and, the, and, and the, you know, the concrete risks and dangers that it creates within our society. Um, now, some of the most important applications of artificial intelligence intersect with regulatory structure that already exists. And for that reason, um, we can reasonably expect that, that you know, the, the pieces are back basically in place to take care of that for the most part. Um, a good example of that would be self-driving cars, which are clearly going to be regulated by existing agencies that handle you know, regulations for, for vehicles. Um, you may have heard in the United States, for example, that the Department of Transportation has now opened an investigation into Tesla because they've had so many problems with their um, autopilot, their, their so-called full self-driving system, which I think has been you know, probably over-promised over in terms of what the technology can really deliver. So that's just one example of how the regulatory apparatus that is there is, is actually you know, at least beginning to work. And I think you'll see something similar in terms of uh, medical applications of artificial intelligence, where there are agencies like in the US, the FDA that govern medical devices and so forth. So they that will be covered. Um, but there are clearly areas that are gonna sort of fall through the gaps. I know that in many other sessions here, I'm sure you've talked about ethical issues such as the potential for artificial intelligence to be biased, right? For for example, we've seen uh, resume screening systems that look at resumes and decide whether a job applicant should be brought in for, for additional interviews. In some cases, those, those systems have been uh, biased on the basis of gender. In the United States, we've got algorithms used in the criminal justice system, even very, very high stakes scenarios, uh, whether you should be kept in jail, uh, whether you should be approved for a, a home loan, for example, things that really have a dramatic impact on people's lives. And these, these systems in some cases have been shown to be racially biased. And in this case, uh, there is no real regulatory apparatus to oversee this. It's not like you know, the self-driving cars that are already addressed by the Department of Transportation. Um, there is no agency which has the, the authority um, to audit these systems, to make sure that they are in fact fair, to, to, to lay down standards, um, you know, to make sure that, that, that fairness and justice are, are being pursued. And I, I do think that that's absolutely necessary. Um, another area is, is the issues of privacy around facial recognition, for example. I think every country will have to make different choices in terms of how much surveillance you want, because it can indeed be effective in terms of reducing crime um, versus, you know, the, the potential impact on privacy. And then once again, of course, with facial recognition, there have been bias issues uh, based on race and gender as well. So my feeling is that in order to, in essence, fill the gaps that we see in, in these areas that are not currently ad adequately uh, regulated, we probably, in most countries, maybe in all countries, are going to need a new agency that focuses specifically on the implications of artificial intelligence. And this would be something you know, roughly analogous to the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, which deals with you know, security trade, trading. And that agency has enormous um, internal expertise. They, they hire people that understand trading. There's a lot of back and forth, of course, between Wall Street and that agency, which has you know, upsides and downsides to it. But I think you're gonna need something similar with the field of artificial intelligence. There needs to be a specific agency that can actually uh, draw up regulations in areas that are currently underserved and I think that will be critical because it's something that has to happen at, at a very high rate of speed because this technology is advancing very rapidly. Um, and it's not something that we can expect, uh, uh, you know, parliaments or, or the US Congress to handle. You know, th those individuals in government do not have 
the elected officials don't have the necessary expertise or the ability to move quickly enough. So I do think we're going to need a dedicated uh, agency. Um, and then once again, there are other issues with respect to AI that even cannot be handled at the national level. One of the most important would be the advent of fully autonomous weapons, right? Which is one of the most terrifying potential scenarios with artificial intelligence. And that's something that really is um, an international issue. And, and in fact, there, there is a, a resolution before the United Nations to help deal with this, although it's not getting a lot of traction because the United States and Russia and, and China don't support that as at the moment because they're concerned about uh, one of their adversaries, you know, breaking the rules and going ahead and developing these technologies. So there are a lot of uh, regulatory issues in terms of specific applications that I think will need to be dealt with at both a national and an international level. And then the final point I wanna make is, is that most of the, the focus I've had, the work that I've done has been in focused on uh, another potential danger that comes along with artificial intelligence and robotics, which is the potential impact on the job market. Um, I think that there is a real potential for a great many more routine, repetitive, predictable jobs to eventually disappear. They'll, they'll, those jobs are gonna be replaced by artificial intelligence systems or by robots. And that has the potential to leave a lot of people behind in our society. Um, it has the, the potential to greatly amplify inequality uh, beyond what we already see already, you know, especially in the United States. Uh, we've got a tremendously unequal economy, and I think that AI could drive that potentially to a whole new level. So we're definitely going to need, um, you know, policies focused on adapting to that as, as well. Um, and it's, you know, an important thing to consider is not just going to be about blue collar jobs in factories or, or uh, for example, if you look at Amazon warehouses, those environments have already got a lot of robots and you've also got a lot of workers and the people are working together with the robots currently. Um, but the reason people have a, a, you know, a lot of jobs in Amazon warehouses is that the robots cannot yet do uh, many of the things that only people are capable of doing. And that would be things that rely on visual perception, dexterity, hand-eye coordination things like this. But over the next decade, clearly those robots are gonna get a lot better. Uh, and I think that you're gonna see a lot of job displacements, those kinds of environments, whether it's a warehouse, um, a factory, a fast food restaurant, those kinds of restaurants are gonna become a lot less labor intensive. There will be fewer opportunities for, um, for people and that's gonna have a dramatic impact. But at the same time, it will also be impacting knowledge jobs, you know, white collar jobs. Our, uh, Artificial intelligence algorithms are already impacting fields like law and medicine and journalism, uh, and that's only going to accelerate in the future. So any kind of job where you're sitting in front of a computer um, is going to be fully susceptible to automation, I think, again, over the next decade or so. So that's going to bring forth a big transformation. It's going to put a lot of pressure on society and on the economy. And I do think that governments are going to have to have policies to specifically address that. Uh, in particular, we're gonna need a better, stronger so social safety net for people that are you know, displaced by this. We're gonna need policies to help people to the extent that they can retrain or, or repurpose themselves for this new economy. But ultimately, I think that, that many people, uh, in particular, those people that primarily focus on more routine forms of work are gonna tr struggle to make this transition. So I do think that Eventually, we may need a new social contract. We may need um, something like a universal basic income, which is an idea that's getting a lot of attention lately. And I think that that still remains kind of an idea for the future. It's not something that is yet politically um, feasible, I think, at least in most countries. But I do think that it's an idea that you'll see growing in importance. And I think that ultimately, governments are going to have to embrace the idea that artificial intelligence is going to be so transformative that we may have to completely redefine the rules upon which our, our society and our economy operate. So I think those are some very important considerations to keep in mind um, as we go forward. But again, overall, I'm, I'm optimistic about artificial intelligence. I think that overall, the benefits are going to outweigh the risks. We simply need to adapt to the risks and the dangers that come coupled with this technology. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thought with us and uh, 
Mr. Ford uh, shared with us about uh, some cases that might need the uh, regulation most, and also he uh, provided his thought about you know which agency uh, would need to uh, regulate uh, their fields, and also he uh, discussed labor first and about you know what kind of jobs would disappear and what kind of jobs. Uh, you know, remain or so there's uh, maybe artificial intelligence might increase the inequality. Uh, so we will discuss later after uh, full presentations. And the next speaker is Dr. Alex Eng Engler. And now he's in Berlin and he's a fellow at uh, governance studies at the Brookings Institution. And now he's uh, on leave uh, and visiting Berlin to study European AI governance as a full bright uh, Schumann Scholar and Stephen Mercade Senior Fellow. And he's an expert in uh, AI governance and uh, he's going to give a talk about international consideration of the emerging AI governance regimes. Please welcome him with a big applause. Good afternoon to you all. Good morning uh, here from Berlin. You can see the city waking up uh, right behind me. Thanks um, for inviting me, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm happy to be here. Um, I wanna talk in a little specificity, um, hopefully in a way that builds on Simon and, and Martin on the international considerations of emerging EU and AI governance. And I think we actually have seen enough to get a real sense of what's starting to happen in this space. So a little bit of framing um, as Simon was just telling us, at least 60 countries have adopted some form of artificial intelligence policy since 2017. Um, these often consider regulation, research funding, uh, education and talent, um, what to do about underlying AI dependencies like data and compute, um, and maybe highlight specific sectors of national interest. Um, specifically interesting are, the, of course, the regulatory um, developments. They are broadly often a, a core point of international debate and uh, disagreement and discord. And um, so there's, there's sort of generally the case that uh, regulation is strong international considerations um, in the sense of global markets. And uh, there are some unique facilities, sort of unique characteristics of AI that might make you a little more concerned about these. Um, you know, the variety of different ways that AI can be trained and deployed just makes this picture a little more complex. Um, topics like retraining and transfer learning can develop, um, enable an AI model to be trained in one place and then retrained somewhere else, maybe in a different country or with different data or by a different research team. Um, remote access in the cloud uh, means that an AI model trained in one and deployed in one place can be used inside a product or service in another place. And then um, edge or federated devices might mean that a single sort of uh, structure of AI models is working along a bunch of different devices together. You can imagine all these things getting caught up in the overlap between geographically limited AI regulation. Now, um, as a quick aside, before I go into what some of these regulations are trying to look like, I don't actually think this is an argument against these protections. I have written a bunch about the necessity of protections in areas like education, um, for disclosure, um, uh, in hiring. And so I'm actually largely in favor of broader government um, interventions around AI, but we shouldn't ignore the fact that these have international trade um, and uh, implications for global markets. Um, so, you know, an ideal outcome here would be uh, meaningful government oversight that enables this kind of complex supply chain of algorithms that I was just talking about. Um, so the EU, right, has, gets the most attention and coverage here. The Artificial Intelligence Act has a range of new criteria for artificial intelligence. Um, it does have a tier of low risk, which requires more disclosure. It does have a tier of um, unacceptable risk that is banned. But for trade, really, the high risk stuff is the, the larger category that has significant implications. Um, it covers AI and human services, uh, for instance, hiring. Um, and also uh, in products that are already covered by the EU um, product safety legislation, uh, for instance, medical devices. Um, it is risk-based, this is important, um, which means that only a certain type of AI that uh, hits a certain tier of, of risk um, qualifies. That is set by the European Commission in advance, well, first by the law, but it can be updated by the European Commission. 
Um, and interestingly, there are fairly broad requirements. They sort of set up a list of um, things that might qualify as these sort of foreseeable risks of AI. And while those are broad across the uh, wide swath of AI that falls into high risk, really, it seems like there's going to be some flexibility in whatever the enforcing agencies end up doing. So people have called this a horizontal regulation, meaning that the requirements are set too consistently across many different AI applications. There's some truth to that, but I think in the actual implementation, we'll see different um, enforcement agencies with different authorities sort of using the parts of the law that um, are applied well. So potentially too horizontal, um, but, but potentially um, would be sectorally specific, which I'll argue in a second is, is what um, we're expecting to see more broadly. And just one note on timing, this could take a while, GDPR, passed five years ago and three or four years ago and then took really three years to issue significant fines after getting set up. So this process took a little while um, to get going, but we have seen that the EU is willing to use its authority and we've seen relatively large fines recently. Um, I'll just mention quickly, the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act are related. They focus on online platforms. They are a broader set of laws, but they do have um, uh, implications for AI in large online platforms. The Digital Markets Act restricts how self-serving some of these algorithms can be and um, in a competition sense. And the Digital Services Act um, enables researcher access that would actually teach us a lot about how these algorithms function in the world. Okay, so that's Europe. And maybe interestingly and far less noticed um, is that the United States is starting to build um, a bit of a patchwork, but also a meaningful regulatory response to AI. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has started an investigation into, into um, AI hiring systems. Um, this is uh, in part pushed by specific commissioner Keith Sonderling, who's very interested in this topic and has um, uh, certainly made quite a few public claims about that EEOC should be moving in this direction. The Federal Trade Commission has warned companies about, about bias and also about fraudulent claims in AI. Um, fraud uh, and, and sort of overstating the power of AI systems is definitely a current problem in the US market around AI systems. A series of five financial regulators um, have uh, come uh, together to uh, create an RFP, really a proposal to study the risks of AI in financial services. Um, uh, you can imagine speed, as Simon was just talking about. You also see uh, bias and lack of transparency in here if you think about fraud. Um, so his, his typology, I think, was as useful and set this up a little bit. Uh, in physical products, um, you can see the Food and Drug Administration um, looking at medical devices. One thing here that they're worried about is the fact that these models update over time. And so because the models update, the function they start with might not be the function they have later, possibly a new AI concern. And then uh, there's a Department of Transportation Autonomous Vehicles platform. Um, AI and governance is a little less, uh, uh, in platform governance is a little less obvious here, but I'll, I just mentioned it because we had the first introduced legislation for independent researcher access this week, which mirrors this important part of the Digital Services Act. Um, you could also argue that NIST, the US standards body, which is building an AI harms framework is another kind of example of this sort of broad growing consensus or broad evolution of agency function towards considering the risks of AI. Um, so what's interesting about all this is what we're seeing is agency level, sectorally specific evolution of regulatory processes for AI. So far, agencies seem to be interested in doing this and there may be some structural limitations, might be harder for them to get data access, but we are sort of starting to see this individual agency, individual regulator evolution. Um, and this is my best guess as to what we are going to expect to see on the world stage. Um, one other thing I'll mention um, on sort of the framing in the US uh, that probably isn't seen by a lot of people. If you look at the staff that the Biden administration has, has hired to work on um, sort of AI in the White House and at the Federal Trade Commission, um, these are some really progressive people who are interested in, um, in applying the novel regulation of AI. <clears throat> um, between what the agencies are already doing and the new staff that's coming in, I actually think we could see a fairly swift adoption and a fairly swift evolution of some of the core regulatory services. 
Um, or at least I'd be surprised if we see no action based on who's been hired um, by this White House. Okay, so what does this mean for um, regulatory cooperation? The first thing I'll notice is, th um, is that the EU and US included uh, AI policy in the Trade and Technology Council, which is an EU-US meeting around technology policy issues. Um, that was interesting in part because AI is the, was one of the least um, sort of long standing issues that they talked about. They talked about other things like semiconductors, export controls that have been around for much longer. Um, maybe a recognition that this is gonna uh, start to be kind of important. Um, and so, okay, so why, why is the TTC doing this? Why should other countries care? Um, the first point is really simple here. As I mentioned, barriers to innovation and dissemination of AI systems. Ideally, solid, fluid global market, sure. Um, secondly, uh, consistent approaches um, can strengthen oversight. If you have different governments with totally different metrics and requirements around how an AI function uh, system should be fair or how it should be robust, um, it might actually make um, different versions within those different countries and make them worse. It would sort of be nice if companies were able to make one really good version of something that met a responsible set of requirements effectively. And then rather than making two or three, maybe not quite as good versions of the same thing. So I think there actually um, is an advantage to that. And then you can imagine the governments uh, reinforcing one another's um, uh, oversight by looking for the same criteria. I also think that shared government regulation and direction improves um, the development of AI, if governments say, hey, this specific type of uh, anti-discrimination is important, this type of robustness is important, that drives research, that drives the development of open source code, that drives best practices, and the market for AI gets hopefully better. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is this is part of a broader alignment of digital democracy, of digital democracy efforts. Um, I think there is a challenge right now to find the democratic response to both a, a sort of recession of democracy and emergence of new technology policy challenges. And this is just one example where alignment kind of um, helps build a community uh, of, of practice on how to responsibly govern technologies. Okay, so how can you do this? Um, some actual steps, really simple stuff. Like you can say international collaboration is a goal in your AI national plan. Um, or your AI regulatory plan. This is um, not particularly common, but it would be nice if people said, hey, yeah, in the long term, we want to make sure we're, we're playing nice with everybody else. Um, shared definitions, not for everything, but creating a shared AI definition for regulatory purposes maybe creates a nice building block um, for, uh, and again, this could be sectorally specific. This could be within um, just within hiring or just within autonomous cars or whatever. Um, th that also helps build a sort of nice uh, building block. Some other ancillary stuff that I think would be valuable. We could decide that funding open source code and funding research projects around trustworthy AI is something that can be done uh, jointly. We could also start um, cooperation between standards bodies. I mentioned the US and the European one here, but um, other national, encouraging national bodies uh, to work together is not a bad idea. The, the harder step actually sectorally specific regulatory alignment is, is more challenging um, because so much of this is currently happening at the agency level, individual government agencies evolving their practices. It means that the number of touch points for an AI systems are different across countries. Um, it means that um, there's a lot of different points of communication. Um, just an example, in the European context, we still don't know and, and won't know until the AI Act is passed and starts to be implemented where various responsibilities for oversight fall. Um, and so you could imagine appointing a central regulator, um, a coordinator to advise sectorally specific efforts, just creating communication internationally. Um, you could imagine that person helping set up agency level information sharing. You could imagine alignment and criteria within those agencies. You can imagine international recognition of one another's certification, um, though again, these are kind of getting less likely as we, we go down the list anytime soon. And then you could also imagine active collaboration or, or enforcement. Um, and so that's uh, really largely um, what I wanted to say other than thanks uh, uh, for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Maybe just a, a final point, which is we're in the early stages of this, but I do think that there's a valuable um, this is a small subset of a valuable broader conversation about the sort of 
democratic community's response to emerging technologies. Um, I think we'll see more of this from the Biden administration. For instance, they just launched a grand challenge around privacy and democracy preserving technologies um, with the United Kingdom. And uh, the Biden administration is also considering expanding export controls to surveillance infrastructure. Um, this is, shouldn't be viewed alone. It is sort of part of this broad democratic response. And um, so I hope to see more development here. Um, and uh, thanks, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you for the great talk, uh, Dr. Angler. And he gave uh, uh, the overview about the AI uh, regulatory development, and we learned a lot, you know, it's the contemporary status of AI regulatory development. And, and I really like the part about the value of international regulation, why we need to work together on this issue. And also the best part of talk is about steps to regulatory collaboration. I think this symposium can be a part of those collaboration. And uh, now we are moving to the last, but not the least speaker. Uh, the last speaker is uh, Professor So Hyung Kim, and she is the esteemed uh, faculty member of our graduate school, and also the former head of the, our graduate school. And he, she is the current director of the Korea Policy Center for the First Industry Revolution, and he, she is the expert in the government R and D policy, and she has, uh, you know, carried out a number of uh, uh, the research projects, including uh, the basic science policy and also large scale science policy project funded by the National Research Foundation and also the World Economic Forum and the European Commission. And she has served uh, numerous government committees and also very knowledgeable about how to work together and how to, you know, ac across the, the borders and also disciplines. Please welcome Professor Kim with the big applause. Okay. Thank you for, oh, let's go back to the first, can you just go back to the first title slide? Okay, uh, thank you for the, for the introduction. Uh, before I begin, uh, let me share some uh, insights from the British historian of science, uh, David Edgerton on when technologies matter. Uh, as we all know, invention is not the same as implementation. We often place too much emphasis on the initial invention or the origin of the technology. But uh, it is when the first real utilization of a concept or device, so rather than the first moment or eureka moment of somebody having an idea for that, when a technology really matters. So once applied in full force, a technology becomes uh, literally the engine of growth. Uh, in this book, uh, uh, exploring the development of our modern industrial consciousness. Uh, the German scholar, uh, hard to pronounce, but Wolfgang, Wolfgang Skybelvich exquisitely uh, described how long distance travel enabled by railways in the 19th century um, transformed the European's sense of uh, distance or time or uh, human autonomy and speed. So the railway tr uh, system transformed not only the landscape, natural landscape, but also our experience of nature itself. So going back to the topic of today's um, you know, symposium, I believe these insights uh, let us clearly see why AI has come to matter now rather than a half a century ago. We know that AI the hardest general purpose technologies in this era of um, digital transformation or fourth industrial revolution, if you like it, to call it, goes back to the Turing machine uh, invented uh, in 1936. But the scale, of scale and intensity of AI development we are witnessing today only seems to indicate this is the very moment of the first real full-scale utilization of this technology in a way to fundamentally uh, alter our notion of who we are, who we are as humans, as well as our relations with anything non-human. Uh, in short, the field of AI research seems to have undergone uh, a colossal transformation in the past two decades, um, morphing from a very small niche area 
into a spiraling web of groundbreaking ideas and innovations that are rapidly uh, diffused. So AI has indeed become uh, the engine of growth, which is why governments around the world have been uh, spending and bow bowing to spend a lot of money in AI development. As you know, uh, the US uh, Innovation and Competition Act that was just passed in July, uh, June uh, 2021 this year, uh, is going to invest $110 billion in the next five years. And 10% uh, of this amount is going to spend on AI, quantum computing, uh, semiconductor, bio, uh, biotechnology, and other uh, technologies. And in fact, even already in 2019, the U.S. Uh, uh, investment uh, on non-federal budget for AI research and development reached 1.1 million, and now it's um, almost 1.5 million. And um, so given the tremendous impact of AI on any aspect of society and the economy, uh, it's not surprising to see governments of advanced countries have worked to create multilateral governance schemes over the last five uh, years. And just in the presentation um, before, uh, Professor Chesterman uh, said that this 2016 is very special because of uh, uh, the scandal related to um, Cambridge uh, Analytics, but in fact, to us South Koreans, it's very memorable year just because of AlphaGo uh, uh, match uh, in March 26. And as you can see here, almost uh, every year we have seen some sort of emergence of uh, international uh, collaboration in terms of ethical guidelines and other stuffs, uh, which were already discussed much in the other sessions. So. Um, in addition to these international efforts, AI policies of uh, individual countries, of course, have also proliferated because AI generates a huge benefits, profits, and opportunities, as well as concerns and, and worries about AI risks. So here's my um, schematic suggestion uh, to understand AI issues requiring uh, policies and governance frameworks. So I named that uh, four phases of AI. So the first one is um, how we can promote AI policies, AI, I don't know, AI technologies. So this is really the typical area of research and development policy for AI. The second area is uh, what can be done to solve or, or address the technical or scientific challenges of AI as a technology. So that's uh, still a policy question at the same time being a very fundamental work to be done uh, to advance this technology. Oh, sorry. The th third one is going to be uh, what can be done uh, using AI uh, in, uh, in order to address many issues, uh, many problems around the world, such as uh, climate change or poverty problems or, or even uh, refugee crisis. So this is uh, also a very interesting area of research and development policy to utilize the consequences or the, uh, the, the application potentials of AI. The last one is, I guess, what we are seeing <laughs> very much uh, often these days, you know, policies to deal with problems or uh, um, risks generated by AI. So uh, roughly these four phases can be grouped into two categories again. Uh, but anyway, the point is uh, here, as you can see, uh, we can think of two uh, perspectives. One, how we can utilize AI in order to address the certain problems, which is the second aspect, uh, while we also can address some of the questions that we have to uh, resolve in order to uh, promote uh, these technologies. But I'm going to just very briefly touch upon two phases uh, for AI and by AI. And I guess South Korea is best uh, demonstration of uh, what can be done in order to promote AI. So right after the AlphaGo uh, match, uh, the government uh, uh, decided to push a lot of uh, 
projects in the name of national strategic uh, project uh, for AI that was just uh, two months after the, the match. And then over the next five years, we have seen almost every major uh, announcement of what the government could do, would do. And the third, uh, fourth one, the national AI strategy is really the pinnacle of the government effort uh, to organize the governmental effort and also uh, researchers' effort into uh, AI promotion. And even in 2020, in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, the government also worked to um, create the national guidelines for AI ethics, although this is often criticized because how come a government uh, uh, could, uh, being the agent of creating AI ethics, which probably have to be done by uh, all stakeholder collaboration uh, as indicated in the uh, previous um, uh, morning session. And, but then um, this is almost the last slide. And here, uh, I guess we can think of two kinds of risks. So one uh, intended, uh, very, very blind uh, effort to use AI, for, for example, for attacks and other uh, uh, malicious uh, uh, intentions, right? And also, there are risks that are not actually intended. Uh, these are studied very heavily, whether we could actually develop technologies to address these extant risks. But then, uh, in fact, there is another <laughs> kind of very, very uh, structural risk which is really hard to detect. So going back to the example of the railway system, uh, there is also an, uh, some interpretation uh, of the World, World War One, uh, in which it, the railway system actually played some role uh, to help the war actually break out. Uh, because this is a very fast way of transportation and it has a kind of all or nothing um, sort of uh, mobilization. So technologies could have very, very far reaching impact even when, mis even not when misused or, or even when uh, things are really working as intended. So we really have to think about these structural risks because like nuclear weapons, AI could be actually AI are dual use capabilities. So the way, the more we find these technologies, in fact, uh, it's quite uh, obvious that we would be exposed to more risks, not only in terms of economic uh, problems, but also uh, big challenges to the international order and you know, peace. So uh, some of these the structural risks are so much structural, so instead of really getting rid of this, we could we have to think about how we can live with these uh, structural trade-offs in which sometimes uh, uh, when you uh, try to achieve a private gain, in fact, uh, you inevitably uh, generate public harms. So this is really my final slide. And here, mm, as you can see uh, from this uh, uh, World Economic Forum report from uh, the last year, what's interesting is uh, some of these AI issues that would be arising now, there are arising now and also in the near term and also longer term. In fact, it's so fast changing so that in the near term risks we see geopolitical technological competition and also AI powered uh, surveillance uh, stuffs and these things are actually the reality right now. So uh, what that means is, uh, as, uh, so like the speed of technological changes, the speed of uh, policy issues requiring attention uh, uh, is really also uh, dramatic so that both policy scholars and makers have to be very much alert to the latest technological development. At the same time, um, technicians or engineers and scientists working on uh, AI have to be very vigilant of what the genie out of the bottle can do and should not do. So that's uh, all I have for today, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, uh, Professor Kim. And we learned a lot about the Korean cases and also the four phases of AI policy. Now we are moving to the floor discussion, and we have wonderful scholars here. And I feel 
the word that most used in this session is regulation. All of them are from different fields, but we discuss, you know, how and when and why and who, you know, regulate the AI policy. But as you know, that policy is very uh, contextual because each country, each nation has different regulations. And for example, in South Korea, we don't have a general anti-discrimination law. So as Professor Chess, uh, the uh, Chesterman mentioned that, you know, some of the AI policy are covered by the existing law and existing regulation. But as he mentioned, that not all of them, most of them. So now we are moving to the, the, the questions. So I would like to uh, ask each of you, because we discuss a lot about the general policy, but it's very, you know, hard to know the, uh, the some, you know, well-known examples we know some of uh, the AI uh, the, the changes, uh, say that AlphaGo or you know, the, the chatbot, et cetera. But about the policy, as you know, that one of the most challenges about AI is speed. But it takes time to develop a policy. So there's always a structural lag in the policies behind. But is there any good exemplary uh, the cases, you know, how to government to uh, regulate AI policy or maybe not regulate uh, AI? Uh, maybe the first uh, the speaker, the Professor Chessman. Sure, it's a great question. And actually, I'll, I'll pick up from a point that Professor Kim was making at the end of her very interesting presentation, which is looking for analogies with other technology which had the potential for great benefit, but also great risk. Uh, and, and she mentioned nuclear energy. And that's actually something that I have, have written about uh, because I think there is at least a compelling analogy. It's not a complete analogy, uh, but when the technologists, when the scientists doing research into nuclear energy during the second world war, they were deeply aware that this technology had the potential obviously for destruction. And that was the, the weapons part, uh, but also for tremendous benefit in terms of energy production, agriculture, medicine. Uh, and so what the world did, the very first resolution of the UN General Assembly uh, was part of an effort to ensure that this new technology would be used for good and not for harm. Uh, now, it's, it's a challenge to, to extrapolate from that to artificial intelligence, but you could imagine a kind of bargain uh, similar to what we had in the form of the International Atomic Energy Agency which was created about a dozen years after the United Nations, where at its heart is a grand bargain that in exchange for sharing the beneficial forms of nuclear energy, uh, that went hand in hand with a commitment not to weaponize it. Uh, and so some of the red lines we've been talking about, uh, in my case, um, uh, the weaponization of uh, artificial intelligence through lethal autonomous weapons, uh, or I think Alex talked about uh, real-time biometric surveillance, uh, we've seen sort of the emergence of at least an argument that there should be some red lines that we won't cross, um, but that could be done in exchange for um, a, a commitment to share the benefits of that technology more widely. Uh, so that might be one interesting analogy that's worth exploring. Thank you. Uh, that's that's great example of uh, nuclear energy and the UN assembly's uh, the the activity. And uh, Mr. Ford, and would you add more uh, to this question? Yeah, I agree. I mean, that, that's a good example. And as, as I said earlier, I think ultimately we will need uh, an agency, perhaps a nuclear regulatory agency that will focus specifically on AI. I, I noted that Alex um, pointed out that some of the existing agencies um, are taking on, you know, some of this stuff, but, but in the long run, I suspect that that's going to be need to be consolidated into an agency with the expertise to you know, not only formulate new regulations for evolving technologies, but to address entirely new applications of artificial intelligence that come along. I mean, we, no one can predict five years from now how exactly AI is gonna be utilized or what the issues are gonna be, or maybe not even a year from now. So I think we're gonna really need, in some ways, this, this is a technology that is gonna be vastly more dynamic and also more systemic than many of the other technologies that, that we already regulate. So I, I really think um, it's going to present a particular challenge and probably we're gonna need a, a dedicated agency to, to take that on. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ford uh, mentioned that uh, we needed to uh, you know, consider the aspect of the application, uh, not just about development AI and the regulation. Okay, the, uh, Dr. Dr. Alex, uh, would, you, uh, would you answer these questions? Of course, thank you. So um, I, I actually agree with Martin's broad point that the complexity of AI systems and the complexity of regulations is going to grow and it's really hard to foresee. Um, interestingly though, I ended a different conclusion, which is that you need distributed technology expertise throughout regulatory agencies. Um, I think there's almost nothing you can say about AI that is broadly true. It is a general purpose technology, its effects and its outcomes are incredibly sectorally specific and even often application specific. Um, that's why I tend to think you're gonna need um, sectorally specific experts. Um, we're also learning this lesson with how to make governments more uh, technology ca uh, capable, how to make governments better at using technology themselves, which is that rather than having one central digital agency to do digital work, we're having distributed uh, technology teams that work across government um, to make agencies use technology better. Um, so I, I think of those things a little analogously. That being said, it's an important conversation. You asked about specific examples. I'll mention two things that I think are really straightforward, obvious AI regulatory um, proposals. One is required disclosure. I don't think there's any reason you should be able to use uh, AI systems and not tell people you're using them when it has a meaningful effect on their interaction. Um, having a chat bot for a financial services website or a, um, some sort of medical interaction uh, where you are not disclosing that's a person. And it really can be hard to tell and it's getting, uh, that's only gonna get worse. I don't think there's any value in that. I think we should just say, if you're using an AI system in here, this list of applications, you absolutely have to disclose unequivocally to who's interacting with it that it's an AI system. That's valuable information to, uh, uh, for the, the, the people in this part of the equation. The second, um, we have seen some um, applications of effective computing. This is using, uh, attempting to use AI to pull out information about people's emotional state or about their personality, often from things like their face and how their face is moving or their tone and cadence in their speech. Um, this is a pretty dangerous application of AI that broadly doesn't work, it's broadly pseudoscientific in its basis. Um, and we should, um, I, I personally ban it in high risk applications, especially for instance, in law enforcement, though I would also say in hiring. And if it turns out it works magically in the future, we can reconsider, um, but with that, there's just no evidence for that so far. Um, and so none, very few of these have happened yet, but I do think there are really clear examples of uh, regulatory um, eliminations that we could we'd put in place, and those are two. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Engler. It's very interesting cases, and also it's a kind of technology that uh, you know we can use in everyday life, and so uh, I feel it, it would be a very important issue. And uh, Professor Kim, uh, would you uh, add more comments on this? So uh, I like that every uh, panelist likes my um, analogy of AI <laughs> uh, to uh, nuclear uh, power. Uh, but then there's a very, very crucial difference between the two technology, the technologies. So nuclear uh, energy uh, is very much a centralized technological system. So you see there's a big nuclear plant. Everybody can see the building and there's a very, very uh, meticulous way of organizing, uh, way of organizing all kinds of, of flows, while whereas AI is not something that we can see. It's very much distributed and very much applied in something that we don't even expect, right, uh, to be used. So, uh, creating a centralized international um, agency for AI regulation is is not going to be really the perfect solution given the fundamental difference uh, of the technology itself. Uh, what I uh, try to point out in this analogy is that this is fundamentally dual use technology. So the tremendous impact on uh, especially military uh, applications. But now uh, going back to maybe uh, Dr. Engler's um, point, 
Uh, I guess the reason why it's hard to think of certain best practices of AI policy is because uh, we, it doesn't really make sense to have a single AI regulation policy because AI is so distributed. So we have a very interesting examples in the form of regulation of, for example, platform companies because they are generating a lot of non-regular uh, very special kind of labor force. As you know, we have all delivery workers uh, uh, you know, giving us food and everyday life stops in this uh, non-contact uh, situation because of COVID-19. So we, and even uh, European GDPR is not really the uh, law or regulation with the name of AI. It actually regulates a certain ways uh, of using or transporting uh, uh, data, right? Tra uh, transferring data. So uh, instead of thinking about the best practices, uh, probably for the time being, we're going to have many, many small instances of tackling uh, these best development <laughs> of AI uh, or penetration of AI applications into the economy. So uh, having, rather than having very much big overarching uh, framework of governance, uh, we could at least have a certain uh, governance principles, but it's going to be very hard to have that sort of a very uh, you know, bird's eye view kind of structure, uh, like what, this, what we saw uh, in the, uh, the post-war uh, era. So that's uh, uh, not the perfect <laughs> reply to this request for specific examples, but that's uh, how I think of the uh, regulatory uh, issue. Oh, that's a great point that the difference between the nuclear uh, the technolo nuclear energy technology and artificial intelligence technology is uh, one is very centralized and uh, the other is uh, very invisible or so, you know, uh, the, the divergent and it's the da uh, daily, you know, users. So there are lots of uh, different stakeholders and developers in AI uh, development. So that's why it's even more hard to regulate and, you know, develop a policy. And now time is up. So I, I'm going to uh, uh, close up this session. And thank you so much for all the speakers, also the audience on YouTube and also here. And the AI Institute at KAIST is looking for the international collaboration. And we look forward to meeting you uh, in the future in uh, South Korea. And thank you. Thank you so much. Please give, give them a big hand once again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations and discussion.